Section 2 of Our Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christina Roth. Our Street by William Makepeace Thackeray. Our House and Our Street. We must begin our little descriptions where, they say, charity should begin at home. Mrs. Camisole, my landlady, will be rather surprised when she reads this, and finds that a good-natured tenant who has never complained of her impositions for fifteen years understands every one of her tricks, and treats them not with anger, but with scorn, with silent scorn. On the 18th of December, 1837, for instance, coming gently downstairs, and before my usual wont, I saw you seated in my armchair, peeping into a letter that came from my aunt in the country, just as if it had been addressed to you and not to M. A. Titmarsh, Esquire. Did I make any disturbance? Far from it. I slunk back to my bedroom, being enabled to walk silently in the beautiful pair of worsted slippers Miss Penelope Jake worked for me. They are worn out now, dear Penelope. And then, rattling open the door with a great noise, descended the stairs, singing Son Vergin Vezzosa at the top of my voice. You were not in my sitting room, Mrs. Camisole, when I entered that apartment. You have been reading all my letters, papers, manuscripts, brilliance of verses, inchoate articles for the Morning Post and Morning Chronicle, invitations to dinner and tea, all my family letters, all Eliza Townley's letters, from the first, in which she declared that to be the bride of her beloved Michelagnolo was the fondest wish of her maiden heart, to the last, in which she announced that her Thomas was the best of husbands, and signed herself Eliza Slugger, all Mary Farmer's letters, all Elemy Delamere's, all that poor, foolish old Miss McWerther's, whom I would as soon marry as... In a word, I know that you, you hawk-beaked, keen-eyed, sleepless, indefatigable, old Mrs. Camisole, have read all my papers for these ten years. I know that you cast your curious old eyes over all the manuscripts which you find in my coat pockets, and those of my pantaloons, as they hang in a drapery over the door-handle of my bedroom. I know that you count the money in my green and gold purse, which Lucy Netterville gave me, and speculate on the manner in which I have laid out the difference between today and yesterday. I know that you have an understanding with the laundress, to whom you say that you are all-powerful with me, threatening to take away my practice from her, unless she gets up gratis some of your fine linen. I know that we both have a pennyworth of cream for breakfast, which is brought in in the same little can, and I know who has the most for her share. I know how many lumps of sugar you take from each pound as it arrives. I have counted the lumps, you old thief, and for years I have never said a word, except to Miss Clapperclaw, the first-floor lodger. Once I put a bottle of pale brandy into that cupboard of which you and I only have keys, and the liquor wasted and wasted away, until it was all gone. You drank the whole of it, you wicked old woman. You, a lady, indeed. I know your rage when they did me the honor to elect me a member of the Polifloy Boyot Halassus Club, and I ceased consequently to dine at home. When I did dine at home, on a beefsteak, let us say, I should like to know what you had for supper. You first amputated portions of the meat when raw. You abstracted more when cooked. Do you think I was taken in by your flimsy pretenses? I wonder how you could dare to do such things before your maids, you, a clergyman's daughter and widow, indeed, whom you yourself were always charging with roguery. Yes, the insolence of the old woman is unbearable, and I must break out at last. If she goes off in a fit at reading this, I'm sure I shan't mind. 
She has two unhappy wenches, against whom her old tongue is clacking from morning till night. She pounces on them at all hours. It was but this morning at eight, when poor Molly was brooming the steps, and the baker, paying her by no means unmerited compliments, that my landlady came whirling out of the ground-floor front and sent the poor girl whimpering into the kitchen. Were it but for her conduct to her mates, I was determined publicly to denounce her. These poor wretches she causes to lead the lives of demons, and not content with bullying them all day, she sleeps at night in the same room with them, so that she may have them up before daybreak and scold them while they are dressing. Certain it is that between her and Miss Clapperclaw on the first floor, the poor wenches led a dismal life. My dear Miss Clapperclaw, I hope you will excuse me for having placed you in the title page of my little book, looking out of your accustomed window and having your eyeglasses ready to spy the whole street, which you know better than any inhabitant of it. It is to you that I owe most of my knowledge of our neighbors. From you it is that most of the facts and observations contained in these brief pages are taken. Many a night, over our tea, have we talked amiably about our neighbors and their little failings. And as I know that you speak of mine pretty freely, why, let me say, my dear Bessie, that if we have not built up our street between us, at least we have pulled it to pieces. End of section 2